All right, welcome to Unit 1, Lesson 11. This is the second video. We have about four or five problems to do. So let's just get right into it. Quick summary, and if you need to go back and watch Part 1 of Unit 1, Lesson 11, just to kind of refresh your memory on what we're doing, go right ahead and do that. But we are using the calculator to help us solve a lot of word problems, specifically that deal with quadratics. All right? So as I look at question one here, I'm going to reread it. We've already done part A, but there are other parts that we need to finish. Okay? Sample question one says, a baseball player throws a ball from the outfield towards home plate. The ball's height above the ground is modeled by the equation y equals negative 16x squared plus 4x plus 6. This equation right here. Where y, okay, where y represents the height in feet, okay, and x represents time in seconds, all right? The ball is initially thrown from a height of 6 feet. If necessary, round your answer to the nearest hundredth. And nearest hundredth, obviously, that is two decimal places. You should know that. So for part A, we plugged our equation, our negative 16x squared plus 48x plus 6, into the calculator. And A says, what is the maximum height in feet that the ball reaches? Well, when we see the word maximum, we know that is the vertex, because the vertex is the absolute low point or the absolute high point. In this case, my parabola opened down, so it was the absolute high point. So I use the max function in the calculator. You'll see it right here. And I have a coordinate. X is 1.5, and Y is 42. Now we need to call, uh, go back and recall what the X and Y represented. The X was time in seconds, and the Y was feet, height, and feet. So at 1.5 seconds, we reached a max height of 42 feet. Now this question, part A, was only asking us for the max height. So we need to notify our people grading the test here that the max height was 42 feet. So you want to circle that number right there. They're not asking for a coordinate. They're asking for the maximum height and feet. And it's circled right there at 42. Now you're caught up. Let's move on to part B. Part B says, what is the height of the ball after two seconds? Hmm. Well, time in seconds, that's my x value, which I have. They're looking for the height. What is the height? That's my y value, height in feet. So they give me an x. I need to find a y. I can do this one of two ways. I can plug in the number into our equation, or I can look at my table. If we go to y equals, when we did part A, this is our equation, and it was typed in. If I look at my table, okay, and I bring this bad boy over here, yeah, right here, why not, okay? When time, or my x value is 2 seconds, what's my height? The y value is my height. The x value is my time. My height is 38 feet. Now, our equation was negative 16x squared plus 48x plus 6. That equals my height. I could have. I could have taken x is 2 seconds. I could have thrown a 2 into here and a 2 into this spot as well, and that would have equaled 38 feet. But the table does that for me. For example, at one second, how high is the ball? That is also 38 feet. At time zero, when we started, didn't they say it started at 6 seconds? And so forth. So my table really does all the plugging in and solving for me. All right? So let's take a look at C. How many seconds after the ball is thrown will it again be six feet above the ground? It starts six feet above the ground. If I look over here, highlighter, let's go blue. 
Okay, the ball is initially thrown from a height of six feet. So at time zero, when we start, when we initially start this whole process, it's at six feet. They're asking us how many seconds after the ball is thrown will it again be six feet. Now I can do this one of two ways. I can look at my table again and I can say, well, it started at six feet. Oh, look at right here, how beautiful. It'll hit six feet again at three seconds. Okay, so at three seconds. There's our answer. We got it. Now, I said there was a second way, and it's more complicated. I could have looked at my graph, all right? And this is my graph. Well, if I want to know when I will be at a height of six feet, when my y value is six, I can just figure out where the y value is equal to six and graph that line right there. And it will cross, actually, I could do that right in the calculator for you if you would like, because, you know, I'm just that kind of dude. Let's look at our window. Right now, I'm going way up to 100, from down to 100 and up to 100 on the graph, okay? Well, the max height, it seems to be, was 42, wasn't it? Wasn't that our max height from part A? So let's say I only go to 50. And let's say here I go to 0. I just want to go from 0 to 50. And actually, let's make that negative 10. And we'll go up by 5s. So my scale will be by 5s. So if I graph this now, Right, there's my graph, and there uh, I can look at this here, and all these tick marks go up by 5, okay? All these tick marks on my y-axis go up by 5. I want to know when it's going to be equal to 6 again, all right? So when I graph that, it happens at two spots, okay? It happens at two spots. Here's 6 when we start when x is 0. And then they intersect again right here when x is 3. Right? So how do I know that that intersection point right here is going to be at 3? Well, I use the intersection function in the calculator. Second, trace, that gives me my calc menu. And choice 5 is to intersect. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move closer to the intersection point that I want to be at. Okay. And on our little chart table in the front, when we use this, I made a note, hit enter three times. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. Bang, bang, bang. And that gives me an answer. That gives me an answer. We'll see it right here. Wow, this is looking very messy. When we get a height of six feet, it will happen again at a time of three seconds. So there are multiple ways to do this. All right. Uh, I would obviously suggest looking at the table, but if it was not on the table, you would have to use your intersection function, all right? And more times than not, if this were an example on the final, it wouldn't be nice and neat right on the table for you. It'd be some random decimal number, and you would have to use the intersection function. All right. All right. Last question. When will the ball hit the ground? Well, here's a bigger question. They're asking us for when. That means I need to know the time, which is my x value. That's what they're asking us for. So we need the height. The ground has a height of 0, and that's y. Isn't y height? It is. So once again, we're going to go to our calculator here. All right, let's just craft this bad boy. Let's get rid of the y equals 6. We don't need that anymore. All right, and some of you might say, well, shouldn't we make that equal to 0? I could, but if I have an equation, okay, here is our original equation, and I set it equal to 0, that means I want to find the roots, the solutions, the x-intercepts, okay? Root solutions, x-intercepts, all right? 
or the zeros. They sometimes call those the zeros as well. Again, this was on that table. The x-intercept is right where it crosses the x-axis. So let's just figure out where it crosses the x-axis. And the calculator will do that for us. So here's my graph. Mm, up, down. I want to find where it crosses right here. This is where it hits the ground. All right, that zero. Okay, because we throw the ball in the air. That, 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 that's really a model of what the ball would look like. It's going up, hits 42 feet up here, hits uh, six feet again right at three seconds. These are all problems we've already solved. Then boom, hits the ground. I am going to calculate my zero or my x-intercept. And I got to make the bow tie. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be left. And we've done this before in previous lessons. Okay, I want to be left of the zero and hit enter. And it puts that little arrow right here signifying that's the left Okay, the left side of my zero, I go right, hit enter. Okay, now I have the right arrow and it made the bow tie. And I hit enter one more time and it gives me my solution. So let's bring this out here. When will it hit the ground? Okay, it will hit the ground at this time. 3.12018. Earlier in the problem, they asked us to round to the nearest hundredth if we needed to. So that would happen at approximately 3.12 seconds. And there you go. All right, sample question two. Barb pulled the plug in her bathtub, and it started to drain. All right, if you don't know how a tub works... You plug the drain, and the water stays in the tub. You unplug the drain, and the water goes down the drain, okay? And the water decreases in level. You get less and less water in there. All right, why do I say that? Because you need to kind of use some common sense when we're solving these problems. And to me, that's a, a high common sense, you know, observation right there. But the amount of water in the tub as it drains, is represented by this equation, L equals 5T squared minus 8T plus 120, where L represents the number of liters of water in the bathtub. Boom, that's my L. And T represents the amount of time in minutes since the plug was pulled. I have a, oh, I'm going to have to go lighter than that. Let's go here. We have a T here, and we have a T here. All right? So, let's look at A. How many liters of water were in the bathtub when Barb pulled the plug? Show your reasoning. All right. How many liters of water were in the bathtub when Barb pulled the plug? That means when she first pulled the plug, when this whole process started, 99% of the time, we start, okay, how many liters of the tub were in the bathtub when Barb pulled? That's the beginning. That is when we have a time of zero. Whenever we start things, a race, whatever, the clock starts at zero, all right? Now, you might say, well, what about quarters in a football game? We count down. Yeah, that's okay. Good for you. You're smart. But we always count time zero. Okay? We always start. Whenever we're timing anything, we start from zero, and then we see when someone finishes a race or whatever. Okay? So, how many liters in the bathtub when Barb pulled the plug? All right? Well, I can take my equation... Right, this is what they give me at time zero. All right, here we go. Zero for this T and a zero for this T. So if I have negative five times zero squared minus eight times zero plus 120, well, these go away. Anything times zero is zero. There are 120 liters. All right. It says, show your reasoning. Uh, normally, they either say explain, that means words, 
or they say justify, which means math. If they say show your reasoning, this to me shows reasoning. I am displaying to you the reason why my answer is 120. Because when Barb pulled the plug, that's when we start that clock, right at time zero. Again, the amount of time in minutes since the plug was pulled, we start at zero. All right? Let us look at B. Determine to the nearest tenth of a minute. As soon as I have to round a decimal, I always think I'm going to have to use a calculator. All right? The amount of time. This is what we need to determine. This is what they're asking us for. So we're going to find T. It takes for all of the water to drain. If all of the water drains, that means how many liters would I have left? I would have nothing left. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my equation, negative 5T squared minus 8T plus 120, and set it equal to zero because it's equal to liters. To me, whenever I see something equal to zero, I need to solve. I need to find the solution. I need to find the zeros. That's also my x intercepts. So I'm going to graph this thing and I'm going to find the x intercepts. All right. Let me move this bad boy over. Da -da 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 -da. Go back on. I always like to hit second plus 712. That clears my calculator of everything. And it even puts the window on my graph to default a 10 by 10 window. We'll change that in a moment. Minus 5. We don't have a T in the calculator. There's actually a T right here, so we always use X. I'm going to use X's instead of these T's. That's fine. 5X squared minus 8X plus 120. If I graph this, I'm probably not going to see. I see my two zeros, okay? But I don't see my vertex. I don't need the vertex here. But just out of habit, let's let's change the window so we can see everything. I'm going to go to zoom fit. Oh, I believe that's choice zero right there. I hit zoom. I'm going to hit option zero. And it will change this. Now I can see the vertex right here. Bam. And here's the zero. Now at, at time zero for part A, 120. So again, this x axis represents time. Zero seconds, one second. To actually, it's time in minutes, isn't it? Zero minutes is at the origin. One minute, two minute, three minute, and so forth. It looks like it's going to be somewhere close to four minutes. But at time zero, remember when time was zero, didn't I have 120 liters? So when time is zero, if I go all the way up here, that's 120. Do you need that to know this problem, B? No, I'm just connecting everything for you. So let's find to the nearest tenth of a minute when our leaders, our Ys, go back down to zero, which is right here. Second trace, because I'm going to calculate the zero, number two. And i got to make the bow tie. So where am I? There I am. I'm going to be just left of my zero. I'm going to hit enter. It's going to put a little arrow up here, and this will say left and change to right. Boom. Okay, my arrow... It actually put right where my little buggy was, and it did change the right. So now I'm going to move down here to the right. I'm going to hit enter. I should get my right arrow, and this should turn to the word guess. There it is. My arrows point toward each other. I'm good. Calculator says, do you want me to guess? Absolutely. I hit enter. And when my Y value or my liters is zero, my X value or my time in minutes is 4.163. Now, they want me to round that to the nearest tenth. That's one decimal place. So that will be approximately 4.2 minutes. And there you go. Sample question four. We skipped over three. I took that out of the notes, and we're going right to four. A tour company has a ticket price that goes down $2 
for every additional person who signs up for a group trip. They charge per person 52 minus 2N. This is what they charge. That's their price, all right? It's represented by an equation, or excuse me, an expression, where N is the number of people that go on the trip, okay? So if I have 10 people that go on the trip, I put a 10 in here, and I figure that out, and that's my cost per person. If I have 20 people that go on the trip, I put a 20 in for N, figure that out, and that's my cost per person. All right? The total revenue, which is R, as a function of the number of people who go on the trip, is this right here. That equals my revenue. All right? Cool. How many people maximize the revenue of the Torah company? Two things that should jump out at you right now. First, revenue. My revenue equals 52n minus 2n squared. That's a parabola because the degree is 2. The biggest term is 2. All right. The second thing that should pop out at you, maximize. I know in a parabola that is either the high or a low point, which means that's my vertex. So I'm going to plug in my equation here and figure out my vertexes. And they want to know the maximum number of people. So I need to go back here and see uh, what is the number of people. N is the number of people. All right. So if I'm looking at my equation, I can say y equals 52x minus 2x squared. All right. That's the same thing. So my x variable in the calculator is going to be my n variable, which is my people. Okay. My people is my independent variable. And my y or my revenue is dependent because my revenue depends on the number of people I have. So let's go ahead and put this in the calculator right now. So I'm going to move this over here, da, 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 turn it back on. And because I always like to clear my calculator, I'm going to hit second plus 712. Go to y equals, and I'm going to put this in here. Okay, 52x minus 2x squared. And if I graph this, I'm probably not going to see the whole... No, not at all. I see this one line that goes up. It looks like it goes from left to right. So it looks like it's going way up here, then way down here. Zoom zero, or if I scroll down to zero, is to fit. And what that's going to do is that's going to try to display the important characteristics, meaning the vertex and both of my zeros, or x-intercepts. So let's change this. There it is. There's one. It doesn't even show us the other one. In fact, I don't even know where the maximum point is here. I know this graph probably goes here, and if you follow my, my cursor, it's probably going to come down like maybe right here. So I've probably got to at least double the x value maximum what I'm seeing here. I want to increase the x's that I'm seeing. So I'm going to change my window. It looks like my x maximum only goes to 10. Let's make it go to 30. Why not? I really don't have to see this far down. You can leave the y values the same if you want. Um, I'm going to just call that negative 100. And I always like to see higher up on the y-axis. Again, you didn't have to change these. I'm just going to change them now. And I'm just going to make my tick marks happen every 100. So if I graph that, there we go. Oh, that's so pretty. That's so pretty. Now, what they want us to find is the maximum, okay, or the vertex, but they want the maximum number of people. So, again, n is my number of people, and that's the same thing as our x variable. So, I want to find my maximum, and I want the x coordinate of my vertex, okay? Second, trace, because that brings me to calculate. I want the maximum, which is choice four, right there. And I'm going to make a bow tie. I'm going to be left of it. I hit enter. There's my left bound. Now it's asking me for the right bound. So I go right of the maximum. And that, I can go here. I can go here. 
I can go here. I can go anywhere as long as it's to the right side of the maximum. I hit enter. There's my bow tie. It's asking me, do you want me to guess? Show up. And there it is, 13. The X value represents the number of people. Let's not forget. Okay, so as I do this, we found two pieces of information. Okay? My X value and Y value and my vertex. So my vertex is 13, 3, 38. These are maximums. Okay? To maximize revenue, I need 13 people. And my revenue will max out at 338. So, bam. 13 people. All right. Easy. All right. Well, let's look at the next question. What is the maximum number of people that can sign up in order for our tour company to not lose money? All right. So in order to not lose money, their revenue needs to be zero. If their revenue is negative, they lose money. If their revenue is positive, they make money. So in order for them to not lose money, your revenue has to be zero or better. So if I wanted to say, I could say revenue should be greater than or equal to zero. All right. But we're going to find out what is the maximum number of people. So how many people at most can I bring so that my revenue will stay at zero and it will not go less than zero? All right. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to look at my graph here. Here's my graph. All right. The minimum number of people. Now, let's not forget Y is our revenue. When Y is zero, that's actually the X axis here. Y is 100. 200, 300, 400, 500. Okay, so as I go down 100, my revenue is zero. Then it's negative 100, which means I lose 100 and so forth. I want to know right here where I break even. This obviously would be zero people. That would be the minimum amount of people I would need to break even. They're not asking me for the minimum, the maximum. There are two points where my revenue is zero. I have two X intercepts. They want the maximum or the bigger one. So I'm going to look for this one right here. And I'm going to do that using my zero. I want the x-intercept. Again, second trace, zero, because that's the same thing as roots, solutions, or x-intercepts. Hit enter. i got to do a little bow tie thing. So I'm going to be a little bit left of my zero. Okay, and hit enter. Perfect arrow. Now it's asking me for the right. I'm going to go a little bit right, right down there. It's a little bit right of it, down into the right. Hit enter, pointing toward each other, bow tie. Want me to guess? Absolutely. Here you go. I can have at most, all right, I can have at most 26 people for my revenue to be $0, okay? So 26 people. I tell you, if you know how to use a calculator, it's a wonderful thing for quadratics. Sample question five. The table below gives the average amount in thousands of dollars of an individual's retirement fund. Huh. You guys might not be thinking about this right now, but Mr. Visca definitely is. All right. Here it is. Here's our year. This is going to be our X variable. Here is our Y. That is going to be our amount in thousands of dollars. So let's look at A. Using X equals 1 to represent 1985. So this is 1. Find a quadratic regression model. As soon as I see this, and I love this question, it brings us back. We need to go stat, edit, enter things into L1 and L2, my X and my Y. And I need to have the calculator come up with the quadratic regression for me. All right, this is a review of something we did a little while ago, but it still uses our calculator for quadratics, in this case, to actually come up with the equation of our quadratic. All right, so here's what you got to know. If 85 is 1, 90 is not 2, okay? And please, 
for your X values, don't use these. They tell you one should be 1985. But here's the question. How many years, what number would represent 1990? Is it 1995 years after 1985? Which means this number should be 5 after 1 and so forth. I add another 5 to 11. I add another 5 to 16. I add another 5 to 21 because I add 5 to go here. I add 5 to go here. So I should maintain that same number pacing, if you will. All right. So when I enter these values, I'm going to enter into L1 my x's and into L2 my y's. So this is my L2. Oh, look at that. Crazy. So this is my L2. And this would be my L1 column. That's not a 4. That's an L1. Do we remember how to do that? Well, hopefully we do. Mr. Visco always likes to clear his calculator. Second plus 712. Stat, edit, which is choice one. Here are my wonderful L1 and L2 columns. So it's going to be 1, 6, 11, 16, and 21. Uh, there we go. And then it's 9, 19, 45. 101, 196. Now, it wants me to find a quadratic regression. So I'm going to go stat, calculate. I got to pick five, a quadratic regression. How come? That's what they asked me for. If they asked me for a linear regression, I would have picked four. But they specifically asked me for a quadratic regression. Bang. And I go down here and calculate. I am going to put y1 here, vars. I move over to y variables and I enter twice. Why did I do that? Because now when I calculate this, it takes this and puts it into y1 for me. I will explain that in one moment. All right, here's my equation, and they want that rounded to the nearest thousands. That's three decimal places. Okay, one, two, three. So A is 0.571x squared. B, 3.451, that will stay a one, and it's negative. That arrow is right in the way, and you can't see. That's negative 3.451x, and my C value is 14.251. Positive, 14.251. All right, there it is. There it is to the nearest thousands. Congratulations, you know how to use a calculator. All right, again, the calculator can be such a great tool for solving some of these math problems. So now it wants me to find out, for B, to the nearest thousand dollars. Okay, so I know my money is my Y value. And my Y value is in thousands. So I'm going to just round my Y value to the nearest whole number. What will the fund be worth in 2015? Oh boy. So i got to look up here. I cannot put, okay, my year was my X value. I cannot put 2015 in my year. I've got to continue this pace. 2015 is 10 years after 2005. So I should move 10 spaces from 21 to 31. That's the x value I want to put in. All right? So I'm going to take my equation right here and put 31 into my x value. So Mr. Visca says, I had the calculator by putting y1 into my store quadratic regression, store regression, I hit y equals, look at y1. That's the exact equation. If I were to scroll all the way to the right, I think it goes out 9 or 10 decimals. This is something x squared minus 3.145. This whole thing, without being shortened at all, is in y1. If I were to look at my table, when x is 31,
456.4. So if I were to round that to the nearest whole number, it should be 456. All right. It doesn't ask you to solve it algebraically. When this is 31, remember, that's when 2015 is. My Y, which is in thousands of dollars, is approximately 456.4. But they want it in thousands of dollars, and that's what this is. So they want it to the nearest whole number. So that's approximately 456. If they wanted a label, that would be $1,000. All right? Not too bad. And we are on to the last one. The next one, which happens to be the last one. Which value to the nearest hundredth is a solution when P of X is equal to Q of X? They tell me P of X is 3X squared plus 2X minus 3. And they tell me Q of X is minus 5X, negative 5X minus 2. They're telling you to set them equal. So I'm going to take my P of X and set it equal to my Q of X. Oh, that was a nice save. So P of X is 3X squared plus 2X minus 3. I got that from here because that's P of X. I'm going to set that equal to minus or negative 5X minus 2. I'm just setting those two equal. How do I figure out the answer when I have two graphs? I simply graph them and see where they intersect. Now, it might intersect at two points. They're asking which one of these is a solution. All right, let's go here. And let's put them both in the graphing calculator. Again, I'm going to clear this out. Second plus 712. Go to y equals. And I'm going to put this in y1. 3x squared plus 2x minus a tree. And now I'm going to put this side into y2, negative 5x minus 2. If I graph them both, there's my parabola, and there's my line. Okay, it looks like they cross here, and somewhere up over here, all right? I'm not quite sure where, so I'm going to increase this so I see more of my y. So I'm going to change my window and raise my y maximum. To Tavanti. And there's my parabola. And oh, 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 there's my line. So I'm just going to find both these two intersection points. Second calculates my intersection. Oh, I love this. And I'm closer to this point, so I'm going to hit enter three times, and it will give me this intersection. One, two, three. My first one is 0.135. I'm just going to put this here and save it for later. My second one, I'm going to do the same thing. Second, trace to calculate my intersection, which is five. But now i got to move my little spider dude closer to my other intersection point. It doesn't have to be right on it, just close to it. And I hit enter three times. One, two, three. So my second point, I have both my points. Okay. Negative 2.468 and 1.35. I don't see anything anywhere which is 0.135. Now, this one, if I round it. All right? So, which value to the nearest hundredth is a solution? I would go with the fact that my solutions are my x intercepts. Negative 0.2, or excuse me, negative 2.47. I'm rounding to the hundredth because that's where all my answers are rounded. And 0.14. All right, the only one that has those, well, these ones don't have both of them. These are not the same, okay? That doesn't list both of them. So negative 2.47 is a solution. It's not asking you for both which one is a solution, okay? C and D, I believe, are coordinates. Mm, weird. I'd go with A, because A is my one solution. All right? See ya.